Okay, thanks so much for joining us today on a beautiful uh, sunny afternoon in Vancouver uh, for a conversation uh, that we've entitled Clean Growth Stories, Lessons from Leaders Capturing, Capturing the Climate Opportunity. Uh, my name is Sean Elby and I'm the Regional Director for an organization called Invest in Canada. Invest in Canada is a federal investment promotion agency. We were created about three years ago uh, working to attract foreign direct investment to Canada. Um, we have a fantastic event today and we're gonna run you through the agenda quickly. Um, we have a conversation with an esteemed panel uh, that's coming up shortly. We'll have some time for Q&A, so keep your questions handy. Uh, and then we have some fantastic lightning pitches and a community announcement that you're not going to want to miss. So stick around uh, and stick around for some virtual networking afterwards. Some of our panelists who I've known for many years uh, have agreed to stick around uh, and share some of their uh, experience with you. Um, so highly recommend you stick around and uh, try and bring some of the, you know, remaining virtual events uh, to life. Uh, we're really looking forward to bringing the VEF back uh, into the uh, in-person realm, perhaps a hybrid realm uh, in the near future. Uh, but for today, we're very pleased uh, to have you here uh, and uh, want to thank our board members. We, as you can see, we have just a fantastic group that helps uh, bring these events together. Uh, Kukai and Tony are our new incoming board co-chairs, and huge thanks to Healy and Carrie, uh, who stepped up as vice chairs. I see Scott has moved over from IBM to Salesforce. Congrats, Scott. That's really cool. And uh, Bonnie uh, uh, just does tremendous work for us as our, our treasurer. Uh, and then, of course, to uh, the, the other folks that help make these things happen. Uh, these would not happen uh, without our sponsors. Uh, huge thank you to Telus Ventures who signed on for two years with us as our season presenting sponsor. You'll see Jay Crone, who's joined our board as well, uh, has uh, extensive uh, uh, experience and, and a keen focus on agriculture and agritech. Uh, so watch out for future events uh, where we uh, look forward to par partnering with Telus. Uh, in a much more deeper way. So huge thanks to TELUS. Um, you'll see the other uh, sponsors that helped make these events happen. Uh, big thanks to Silicon Valley Bank, uh, who has two open positions, I noticed. Um, so have a look, check them out. Um, and, uh, and, and also, you know, big thanks to CIBC, Faskin, Douglas College, longstanding uh, sponsor, Corporate Recruiters and Vantage, also longstanding sponsors, and uh, Will Johnson with the Vancouver Tech Journal is on here and uh, helped showcase this event today. We have, uh, you know, just a, a fantastic group of supporters that uh, move these things forward and helps uh, pull them together. Uh, also, one of the reasons why these events uh, go off without a hitch is because of our friends at New Ventures BC who joined us uh, as a delivery partner for all of our virtual events. Uh, we transitioned seamlessly into the virtual world and have been delivering events uh, since the pandemic hit. Uh, fun fact, the VEF used to be named the Vancouver Enterprise Forum and that was named after the MIT Enterprise Forum. Uh, which was uh, what what it was kind of like the TED in the 80s. Yeah, so kind of kind of interesting. We changed the name to the Vancouver Entrepreneurs Forum to hone our focus and, and continue to ensure that these this content is relevant to entrepreneurs and New Ventures VC has done just a, a, an incredible job uh, ensuring that we've transitioned to the virtual realm seamlessly. Uh, please uh, subscribe uh, to all of our social channels. Uh, you can also su subscribe to the Vancouver Tech Journal um, at www.vancouvertechjournal.com, but also um, uh, consider subscribing to our other, uh, our other channels if you want to pay attention to what's coming up at the VEF. 
Uh, Javaria Velkamp is our uh, mo esteemed moderator for today. Javaria and I sat across from each other for six years at the Vancouver Economic Commission. Uh, really pleased to have uh, Javaria join us. She's going to tell you a little bit about the climate law initiative to kick things off. Uh, obviously, she can do it better justice than me, so I'll allow her to uh, introduce uh, the Climate Law Initiative. Um, huge thanks to everyone on our panel who agreed to join. Colin, uh, Lori, Cameron, Sue, Gregor. Uh, they all have an interesting uh, angle on uh, the clean tech story in Vancouver and BC and Canada. They all bring a unique and, and different perspective and Javari is going to walk them through um, a conversation today. Uh, Liz from New Ventures BC is going to put their uh, name in their uh, uh, backgrounds in the chat. So uh, we'll allow you to peruse their uh, CVs uh, as, as, as we go through. So without further ado, I'm going to hand off to Javaria and Javaria is going to get us going. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Um, you set the bye hard that hi there, you said. It's going to go off without a hitch, so um, I hope to deliver on that expectation. Um, like many people, I've been on Zoom since 6 a.m., so I hope uh, we can deliver, but I'm excited to hear from our speakers, so um, thank you, Sean. It's my privilege to be invited here to moderate this session, and as Sean knows and others who know me know, um, I'm very passionate about talking about the green economy, and you may have heard Greta Thunberg's recent speech, and I absolutely appreciate her frustration she called a bunch of things, blah, blah, blah. She said green economy, blah, blah, blah. But I, you know, respectfully disagree because I think the green economy is exactly about action and it's where the rubber hits the road. And I think our panelists today are the perfect people to talk about this climate action. They're working to improve society so that we can have enough food, shelter, energy for our 7 billion people while still living within planetary boundaries. And I think that's the important piece here, right? The IPC's latest report, um, the climate report, tells us that without question now, the man-made carbon emissions are responsible for overheating the planet. And we know from the Paris Agreement that we need to limit this overheating to under 1.5 or 2 degrees. And I'm sure on this call, I don't need to tell people, that might sound inconsequential, but for comparison, the ice age was only six degrees cooler than today on average. So that highlights a few degrees can totally transform the face of our planet. Canada, importantly, is warming twice as fast as the rest of the, as the world. So critical for our resilience, our society, our economy. Our stable climate is the foundation that we're built on, which is where we choose where we're going to plant our crops or build our homes or locate our critical infrastructure and the climate is stable no longer so this is the big deal we need to stay within these guardrails of 1.5 to 2 and we need to cut our emissions in half nine years or reduce to net zero by 2050 um, to get there so with that urgency in mind Let's turn to our panelists and learn how they're supporting this transition um, in our built environment, in the transportation system, in our energy system. I have a little bit of feedback on the line, Sean. Can you hear that? Is that me or is that someone else? Yeah, I think we just need to make sure everyone's mute and then we'll be good to go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn to Laurie first. So your work is focused on the built environment. Three million people move to cities every week, it's astounding. And they need that sustainable, resilient infrastructure, like buildings, community centers that double up as cooling centers now every summer, roads, et cetera. But cement that's critical to our infrastructure is extremely carbon intensive. Um, I think eight to 10% of emissions um, globally come from cement. So at Carbon Cure, I'm excited you're working on this problem. So what's it like? working now with the likes of Amazon, GM, LinkedIn, who are all really interested in your solutions. 
Uh, good question. Thanks, Javaria. And really happy to be here. I will caution that I am, I will be the voice of marketing on today's call. So I'm going to preempt that by saying no super duper technical questions, but anything marketing related, happy to answer. Um, let me just talk a little bit about carbon cure before I kind of get into the, the answer for your, uh, to, to your question. Um, carbon cure was actually established in Halifax in 2012. We've been around for quite a long time, but are developing a pretty large go-to-market team here in Vancouver. Um, the technology that we manufacture injects CO2, which is captured by industrial gas emitters, into fresh concrete while it's being, emit, while it's being mixed. And when the CO2 uh, is injected, it chemically converts into a mineral, which permanently gets sequestered uh, within the concrete and actually improves the compressive strength of the concrete. Um, as a result, concrete producers can remove cement from their mixed designs. Um, and just as a, this is an important differentiation, because I think for a lot of us, or many, at least for me, there is a difference between cement and concrete. So cement is the key ingredient in concrete. It is the most carbon intensive ingredient, and it is also the most expensive ingredient. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, the process of making cement accounts for seven to 8% of the world's CO2 emissions. So it's significant. It's almost three times greater than, than global aviation. Um, so where this becomes, problematic is that concrete's the most abundant man-made material in the world for a reason. It's the foundation on which we live in. And with population growth and increasing urbanization, the world's building stock is expected to double by 2060. So that's the equivalent of building a New York City per month until 2060. That's a lot of concrete that's going to be consumed. So you can start to see how this story lands us into the next piece of your of your uh, of your question, which is large organizations like Amazon and General Motors and LinkedIn, they've all embraced their own climate commitments and they've they've integrated those climate commitments in the into their construction practices. Think about the large tech campuses, the data centers, the warehouses that these organizations are all building. Um, they are large users of concrete. And so these organizations are now understanding that their commitment to building with sustainable building materials can have a material impact on their, um, their climate commitments. Um, they're starting to focus on something called embodied carbon, which is really the carbon footprint of a building before you even turn the lights on. Once the building is operational, you have your, car your operational carbon, but really embodied carbon is where concrete plays a role. And so they're, they're really sort of coming full circle on this, uh, making conscious efforts to build with sustainable building materials. For us, the carbon cure, that's actually only part of the equation. So we don't actually sell carbon cure concrete to large corporates who have a sustainability mandate. We actually sell the technology to ready mix producers, to concrete producers. So in order to actually supply uh, the need for sustainable concrete, we need to build an ecosystem of concrete uh, producers who are willing to adopt new technology. And that's no small feat. That's actually what the biggest challenge is for us. Um, the large corporates have bought into the importance of, of sustainable building materials. The engineering architecture community have built into that. But for us to enable that change, it means transforming a really traditional industry, one concrete producer at a time. Um, so we sell our technology to the concrete producers. They sell through uh, sustainable concrete to Amazon, LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, and while the concrete industry has adopted some um, carbon reduction technologies, it's not enough to meet the fundamental goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. So we need to do more. Um, and introducing technology to a pretty traditional industry is, is challenging. Um, it, it's important, and for us, we've been successful in kind of uh, bridging these barriers, but technology can't be disruptive to their existing operations, right? Every, every minute that a ready mix plant is not operational is, is, is dollars lost. They run on, on very thin margins. So it can't be disruptive. It has to scale quickly. And most importantly, in this whole narrative, is that the there has to be economic value for the producers to actually adopt the technology. They cannot bear the burden of sustainability as a cost to their business. And that's been a, a, a really big driver of, of our um, kind of the circular story of how Amazon and LinkedIn and Microsoft are acquiring technologies on the, on the heels of ready mix producers who've made this commitment. 
the ready mix producers, the concrete producers are not buying because of sustainability reasons. They buy for economic value. So we really need to make sure that um, there's an economic upside for them. So while we sell sustainability and sustainability is the driver for companies like Microsoft, LinkedIn and Amazon, it is actually not the driver, but it is the enabler of that change. Uh, it is not the driver for concrete producers. Ultimately, at the end of the day, they benefit because they deliver a stronger, more sustainable concrete at a lower cost than traditional concrete. So there's real economic value for them. And it's really driving sort of the fulfillment channel of the demand that's happening on the corporate end user side. Hopefully that makes sense. Wow, thank you so much, Laurie. That's really important. While you were talking, I was just thinking how climate economy, really two sides of the same coin, right? And then I think, you know, what you were describing, that importance of market signals. So the climate policies of these large purchases is driving that change along the supply chain, which makes me think if we had bigger purchaser governments, jurisdictions sending the same market signal that really sends that consolidation, makes the economic case. And then I think the final piece you were talking about embodied energy and sort of the, the cost of carbon in that whole equation is also a key driver for, for what you're doing. So thank you. Really, I have so many questions, but we'll save that for after. And I'm seeing there's questions in the chat already. I think we'll get to them at the end. Um, and so I'm gonna move on now to our next panelist and that's Gregor, which I feel funny calling you. I wanna call you Mr. Mayor still, but um, from where I was sitting, uh, working on the green economy for uh, Vancouver, your 10 years as mayor of Vancouver were exciting, transformational, and left a real lasting legacy. Um, I was excited to hear from Brian Buggy, who I think you'll hear from later, that we grew green jobs in Vancouver 90% during those Greener City Action Plan years. So question for you, Gregor, that had to be a hard act to follow. So what was it about the next sea opportunity that drew you in? Um, good question. Thanks, Javaria and, uh, and Sean and everybody for being part of this. Uh, great to be back amongst entrepreneurs um, and, and focused on transforming our economy in a positive way. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, Vancouver made huge progress in the, the decade that I was honored to be uh, at City Hall and green job creation was a huge a core piece of that but you know that ties to livability and resilience uh, reducing our impact on the beautiful environment we get to live in here um, it, it's all the dots all connect um, and it shows that that this transition to a greener world is has all kinds of benefits attached to it and for for all of us here as entrepreneurs uh, we see opportunity and benefits there. I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. Uh, that's what I was doing before I, I got into politics and government. And I went into politics and government wanting to con continue being an entrepreneur. That was my day-to-day -day approach. Um, try to make as much positive change every day as you can, but and have that startup, scale up pace to it, uh, just that urgency. Um, so that's, and I was fortunate to have an amazing team um, to work with a bunch of you uh, to, to help change the city for the better because uh, that's the only way it happens is there you know big team of people at the scale of a, a city like Vancouver it takes a lot of people doing good things together private and public sector um, partnering to do th good things together so I uh, when I finished my time I, I had uh, a great a great time in a challenging time in political life but was happy to go back uh, to being an entrepreneur and I had the good fortune to meet uh, Steve Sidwell, who's a successful entrepreneur, who's built companies here in Vancouver, and, and two brothers from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, Michael and Ben Dombowski, who had, over the previous decade, invented breakthrough materials and a building system, a technology, uh, to transform the way that we build buildings. And a lot of what Lori was talking about in terms of embodied carbon and transforming the way we build, it's, it is essential to our survival, basically, because because the buildings and construction industry is basically the most polluting industry on the planet. It's you know number one for climate pollution, number one for municipal waste. Um, you know lots of problems, and and yet we live in all these homes and buildings, and and most of us don't know that. Um, they they seem quite benign, 
but the impacts are, are on our climate and in our landfills and uh, the, we have to tackle this. So I, I um, we worked a lot on green building, um, zero emission building code, a um, lot of work on the Greenest City Action Team to focus on green buildings and, and our architecture and engineering and design firms, uh, lots of great companies have, have grown up and now export technology around the world on green buildings. Uh, this looked like an amazing market solution uh, coming out of Vancouver here. I joined the team uh, from the outset and it has been, uh, it's been an incredible ride. It's, um, you know, we've, we've managed to uh, attract incredible people to be part of this. Um, it's like an A-team of Vancouverites and Cameron has been a, an example of a, a great partner helping us attract capital and grow. Um, that, that's really, you know, the essential ingredient to success as an entrepreneur. You, you gotta be able to gather momentum and incredible people who are values aligned and uh, and relentless, basically, and and really want to change the world together, um, and get through the tough times as a as a startup and and scaling up a company because it's it is really tough, and we've had um, a great team come together. We've got great technology, uh, and you know it, it's about this big audacious vision of of um, being the first global brand for buildings. Built, we construct buildings. It, manufacture them off-site, assemble them very quickly on-site, low carbon materials, and you end up with a you know, much better building in the end. And that is, um, is what needs to happen in the marketplace, but it's you know, one of the biggest industries in the world. So not, it's not a simple one to transform, but the potential of a, a strong team here in Vancouver focused on that with breakthrough technology, we've got a great shot at it and, and we're scaling dramatically and attracting a lot of investment and great people. So it's, uh, it's been amazing to be part of and really we're just getting started uh, and, and looking forward to uh, you know, showing up on the world stage with uh, great Vancouver technology and, and making the world a better place ultimately, tackling this climate crisis head on. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gregor. I think as you were speaking, I think the values alignment piece really stood out to me. Um, I'll talk about this a bit later, but the governance of our organizations and how we put those human and social values at the heart of decision making is so essential to transformation, I think. Um, and as you said, across the city, I think there was dozens, if not hundreds of people that inspired us and shared their wisdom for that urban transformation. And in fact, all new buildings now emit 70% less carbon in Vancouver than they did in 2007. And that's critical if you think that buildings across the world contribute 40% of emissions. So that's really making big strides in that area. On a personal note, my dad used to live in Moose Jaw and I live in Squamish. So I'm feeling an affinity for an exit right now. It's just, uh... Two great towns <laughs> with Vancouver in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Gregor. Uh, again, lots of questions. Please put them in the chat and we will get to them. So turning Cameron to you now, um, Port Capital, as Gregor mentioned, advised on the Nexi acquisition, uh, uh, advised um, Nexi on a number of things, including the Nexi acquisition recently of the local design and construction firm Omicron. So it seems from where I'm sitting that Nexi has taken previously quite disparate industries, manufacturing, construction, design, rolled it up with technology into a new offering. Um, is this a trend you see in the capital markets when it comes to clean tech? And can you, can you walk us through that? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for including me here. And, and Gregor, thanks for, for all your efforts over the past decade. It's great to be here today. I, I think, when you talk about the capital markets and what they're looking for right now, I think they just see momentum. There's so many ways that you could come at what's happening in, in clean tech, climate tech in general, you know, modular building as its own, as its own sector. But I think what they're seeing right now is if you look at ESG, net zero, there's, there's so many macro tailwinds right now that what fires me up so much is that there's just so much momentum in all of these areas and there's room and capital to help entrepreneurs scale their companies. And I think back to, um, you know, when I think of clean tech, it's not dissimilar in many ways from what digital health has experienced, which is areas of huge depth and, and thought, you know, domain expertise that were long ignored as seeing too complex, too, you know, 
capital wasn't going there. And then all of a sudden, for a variety of reasons, pandemic or in ESG and other things, all of a sudden interest is there and then it floods in. So I think what was great about, about Nexi, and then I just want to go, go back in time for a little bit, I, having worked at, at a big consulting firm, I was involved in a lot of digital transformation initiatives in traditional sectors. And it's sad to say a lot of those would fail. And you'd go in there and you'd, you'd start with great enthusiasm, they'd hire a great team, but you'd quickly see these disparate groups, factions internally that saw innovation as a distraction, as not core to the business, um, fill in the blank. And, and 18, 24 months later, you go back and that new CTO or CIO or whoever that person was that came in to, to drive innovation was frustrated or had moved on. And um, what I think, you know, companies like Nexi is, is that is you have to align these, these, the technology, for example, in the digital transformation issues is often seen as the transformational piece in and of itself. And technology that isn't in, that isn't amplifying your strategy is often a distraction and, and, and won't be the innovation you're hoping for. So that's been my experience historically in a lot of these things. And um, Nexi is, is a great example of, of sort of aligning these diverse stakeholders, you know, between architects and construction and design and, and for, for a product that is driving innovation. So, um, and then I'm going to, fast forward where I think the capital markets are going to go going forward is right now they are looking to place bets and they're and they're placing bets uh seed stage series a series b like they are they're making broad bets I think like you've seen in tech in the tech sector historically they're going to start looking with a narrow lens and I'm speaking to the entrepreneurs in this in this group to companies that can scale um and scale as we all know if you've been through it it's a lot more than the technology and having some capital and having that initial team, it is 50 other things uh, on any given day, most of which you're not equipped to solve and you just try to get through it. And I would say that um, the tech sector is a, the, you know, the traditional tech sector is a great example to look at how quickly you need to innovate, you know, so talent and, you know, cybersecurity and tax strategy and all these things that you think that's not for me. I'm a, you know, I'm a tech company or I'm a, those become the most mission critical things on a given day. So, um, so right now I would say capital markets and clean tech are excited. Groups that I never thought would be making uh, huge bets are. And what I would say to the entrepreneurs in the room is, is capitalize on this moment in time because it's, it's, it's very exciting, but be mindful that scale is a lot more than capital and um, you know, it's culture and talent and all of these things. And, and that's what comes next. And that's what I see a lot of interesting VCs looking for is the companies that are, are aligned like Nexi was to take that next step. And it's more than just the tech in and of itself. Amazing, Cameron, thank you. Those were very insightful comments. And I think highlighting, like you said, the tension between the innovation and kind of the risk return framework of capital markets. I never thought of it like that, like you're de-risking what was very complicated solutions before. Um, it reminds me in sort of frame of reference with COP26, um, you know, these are the climate uh, negotiations in the UN that are happening next month. And there's a strong focus on how do you mobilize private capital in support of a net zero transition? Um, and so I think it'll be important to watch for what comes out of that negotiation, because in addition to learning how these complex systems work, I know that on the finance side, there are tools that are helping like the EU's green taxonomy. So you can go through that and you can say, this is a green project, this is a green solution. And that taxonomy will be used by investors to identify where to place capital. Um, I think some of the other things to look for are uh, mandatory disclosure of climate risk, um, maybe less so for um, uh, ventures, but for, for in Canada, the Canadian securities um, uh, group administrators have put out a paper saying let's look at mandatory disclosure they're going to get some input on it in January but this would be a mandatory um, instrument so the bottom line is we need to look at what what is happening there that's facilitating that transformation as well so thank you so many questions um Sue we're going to move track a little bit now so we're moving from buildings 
into transportation, which is responsible for another 30% of global emissions. And Sue, you've been leading in this space with a truly global career perspective, and now you're leading a Canadian company with solutions. I was looking it up. It's you make electric vehicles even cooler and even better and even more effective um, as a solution for climate change. So amazing solution. Um, what is your assessment of the strengths and opportunities or weaknesses in terms of selling clean technology in Canada? Right. Um, I think I'll start with the strengths. So um, from a strengths perspective, I think that, you know, like most of the countries around the world, Canada is doing a good job of setting some targets, whether that's 100% of electric vehicles by 2035 or investing, you know, there's over a billion dollars of investment. So I think that they're doing a good job in setting those large targets. And of course, you know, a lot of us in the space will sit and think, are, you, are we actually going to hit those targets? Probably not. I don't think it's any different in the US and Europe and China and other countries, but I think it's really good that the government is setting those initial goals for everybody to make a target and start to realize that uh, this is serious, that people need to start thinking about what we do with fleets and passenger vehicles and, and municipal buses and different vehicles. So I think that's, that's one area where we've done very, very well as a government. Um, I think that we don't always really get credit for it, but Canada actually has a very prominent manufacturing sector. We're partnered with a company called Lindemar, even ourselves as an emerging growth company is able to work with partners like that. Um, and Lindemar is one of the top um, manufacturing companies in the world for automotive. Um, there's a lot more than that within the Canadian um, region. So I think that there is a very good manufacturing ability which brings me into the weaknesses. I think we don't do a good enough job supporting our manufacturing sector to be able to transition from combustion and gas into more electric vehicles. And I think we don't encourage um, resources in the country. I know that we have worked very hard. Uh, we've recruited um, over 50 employees just in the last six months um, from all over the world. And I think while our universities do a good job of putting out top engineers and focusing in the right areas with EV. We don't have enough senior level people like they do in US or in Europe in the space that can help to coach these young people. So I think if the government put more into focus on resource, focus on building our talent within our borders, it would go a long way. Um, I think another weakness for us, and we kind of all know that is just generally in the infrastructure. And I think um, you know what concerns me is that we're, we're kind of falling into the comfort level of how we do infrastructure, whether that's a DC charger or putting it at the local coffee shop or putting it in your garage. But there's great tech. We have some, but there's lots of companies that have great tech coming out and kind of going to what Cameron was saying. It's not just the ability to raise capital for these companies. It's how we help them to scale to be able to get that tech out to the market. So there's all kinds of different ways we can think about it. And, and now's the time to do that because as we spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure, we're not gonna be able in five years to go, oh, well, you know, we should have done this differently. So now is the time to kind of think about how we do it differently, how we get demonstrators on the road to try new tech from you know, incumbents and from emerging companies. I think there's great stuff going on all over. Wow, thank you, Sue. Yeah, I mean, it's those are certainly some challenges I think we hear in Canada uh, in the clean tech space. And I know that the solutions, I think there's some things Brian might talk about a little bit later in terms of how we innovate and de-risk solutions. Um, I remember reading a report from Microsoft and Google and Harvard and others. This was 2019, so it's a little while ago, but they looked at technology and they said the technology to fight climate change is here. It's just not deployed at scale yet. So I think there is that, how are we making decisions um, and how are we scaling up? And I, I think today, if they did that report, I'm hoping there will be a lot more inflection points in, in that analysis, um, but we do have a lot of work to do. The work um, Sean mentioned, I'll just talk about CCLI very quickly here, but Canada Climate Law Initiative, the work that we do is um, we offer board training to help directors understand climate risk. Um, and, you know, we developed a program because climate competence is fairly low. Uh, a report shows it's about 7% of boards 
Um, this is listed companies in the US have that climate competence, but it's so important to understand these nuances in order to be able to make the decisions to, to scale the technologies that we need. So thank you for, for sharing that. Sue, last but not least, we're coming to you, Colin. Um, so Chart Industries cited strong government support for hydrogen in Canada as a factor in their recent investment in HTEP alongside I squared capital. And Canada is seen as a leader in hydrogen uh, with global interest in fuel cell solutions and green hydrogen solutions. So how does this investment and in the changing global landscape impact the entrepreneurial trajectory of a company like HTEP? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here with this, uh, this group and this panel and always interested to talk about climate change initiatives and entrepreneurs all mixed together. So it's, uh, I think for a lot of us, it's, uh, it wakes us up too early every morning. <laughs> so um, so just real quick, uh, HTEC is a hydrogen infrastructure company. We are building hydrogen production facilities, distribution and fueling stations. Uh, we have uh, four public ones that people will see around the city. And that's the sort of first step of, of many more. Uh, and really what it's enabling on one side of it is the uh, electric hydrogen transportation. So it goes in parallel to the battery electric. You have the hydrogen electric. It's tackling a different segment of the market. Um, simply, probably to understand it on a light duty side of things, um, we're trying to service those who buy premium gasoline. Um, it's, it's the simplest way to, I think, understand who's going to buy the light duty hydrogen vehicle versus the battery electric side of things. On the heavy duty transportation, it just fits into the longer distance um, uh, range better. So you're not, you know, transportation is all about moving. Uh, so you don't want to move too many batteries around. So that that's sort of the end market of our product, which is hydrogen. Um, so we need to get the hydrogen somewhere, move it to the dispensing point. One of the um, other parts of hydrogen is, is hard to decarbonize areas. Uh, so we're actually working on decarbonizing the cement production. We're working on decarbonizing natural gas, which goes into heating and, and the built environment. So it's so lots of opportunities. And what this, it's taken a long time to build the, the foundation of the platform that uh, I squared and chart uh, have, have seen. So the, the, um, Federal government for many years has been learning and understanding hydrogen. They finally came out with a strategy. And once you have the strategy in place, the policymakers can work with industry to put in the funding programs. And similarly, British Columbia has come out with a hydrogen strategy as well. And a number of other provinces are following suit. So it's like, how do we use this new tool of hydrogen? I mean, hydrogen has been used for hundreds of years. It's one of the, the biggest production or products produced by man as well, but it's all used for um, ammonia production or refining of uh, gasolines and diesels. So um, so when we talked a lot with I squared, so I, I squared is a private equity group. They manage about 27 billion US or 30 billion US. Um, Char is a manufacturer. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of um, promise and I, I encourage other entrepreneurs to think this way is uh, what do these guys want from a platform basis so I squared has a challenge investing in the in the um, the, the classic oil and gas areas for one and they're looking for new investments but it's a whole new area so they see us as a platform to understand the whole hydrogen opportunity as well as to place more money into that area. So it's a way of de-risking, a way of understanding, a way of deal flow. Similar to um, Chart, they were looking for uh, really a path to market. So by investing in HTEC, which is an integrator, user of their equipment, attractor of capital, it was actually a really nice mix. And, and I think um, the private equity guys actually drew up the, the idea of the deal where the strategic equipment could work with a group like us and, and work with them to help uh, backstop some of the investments. So, so from our point of view, we've got a lot of the foundation from the strategy across the country. We've now got good partners um, to help us with our capital needs. So yeah, we're, we're basically in the scale up phase and you're absolutely right, Cameron. It's, it's not really about the technology because ultimately we don't actually have the predictable IP that a lot of people and a lot of investors look for. 
uh, we're building an army of, of people to tackle and build everything that's needed. So that takes a lot of training, a lot of scale up, uh, a lot of understanding all the policies that are around. And, uh, and, and I think also bringing together those energetic and culture, you know, similar culture just to, uh, just to get this done. And it, um, it, it's gaining momentum, not just obviously in our company, but people are getting pretty excited of, you know, they, they can tangibly contribute to the effort that's needed. And I, I think that's been a challenge before. It, it was not easy. I've been at it for 25 years. It was never easy to stay in the clean tech business and make a living and contribute. You had to kind of hold your breath, right? And and now um, there's huge opportunities and we're, we're finding people pretty excited to join our team in the same of the way the rest of these guys are. Um, but bringing that, uh, going back to private equity, as Mark Carney says, we've got to get the whole financial system understanding and being how to play in these capital intensive initiatives that we have to do. And uh, um, so, yeah, super exciting position. It was great. Uh, we didn't actually attract Canadian money, which was a bit uh, a bit interesting, but there was a lot of interest in it. It just happened that these two groups were more aggressive to to do a deal with HTEC. Um, but it's uh yeah i think it's growing and we're, we're basically in scale up mode and uh, need to bring all those pieces together we have more demand for um our services and our products than, than we can manage at this point in time so i'll leave it at that thank you colin <clears throat> very positive note to end on i think that's always a good problem to have <clears throat> um and so I think, you know, bringing together what you were just saying, Colin, there's some really common themes that I've been hearing. Um, you talked about those policy signals aligning um, with the strategy in place uh, across Canada and in different provinces. So we're right back to start the start where we were talking with Laurie about those market signals and being at scale for green solutions. Um, I think I heard in a couple of the comments from our panelists about de-risking, in your case, de-risking of that platform so that it could attract the capital. So we're getting there in the sense of, of making that case as well. And I think just clean solutions are so critical to scale at this point and fast. Um, to sort of put a bow on it, the International Energy Agency is the source for data on where the energy world is going. And according, they came out with a model that looked at how do we get to a net zero world in time with the Paris Accord. And according to their um, pathway to net zero, we cannot have any new oil and gas development starting next year. And so that's just a few months. So the window for action is really closing if we want to avoid massive global heating. And I think that's why we see jurisdictions and other organizations declaring that we're in a climate emergency. Um, and even the IPCC scientists who are very conservative usually use the words code red for the planet in the most recent report. So I was just delighted and excited to hear all of the solutions and all the ways that you and your organizations are scaling this up. You got a couple of months, so I hope, um, <laughs> hope that's a good enough time frame for you. But uh, I do have one closing question that we'll take uh, to all the panelists before I think I'm gonna hand back over to Sean to go into the audience question. So this is a 30 second, please just, you know, um, Colin, you started to share your insights there, but my question for each of you as we close, very brief answer, if you had a crystal ball, what's one thing that governments can do at COP next month that will help secure a safe and resilient future. And I'll go to, we'll do an order of everybody speaking. So I'm gonna start with you, Laurie. Um, if only it was a, a 30 second <laughs> answer. <laughs> um, you know, governments are a key uh, catalyst for change for us in, in, the, in the industry that we play in, both from procurement to policy and regulatory. Uh, for us, it's not just about carbon emissions, but it's really about, um, removing CO2 already in the atmosphere. So we know carbon um, reduction, decarbonizing the world is, is essential, but you know it's not going to be enough. And, and, and policy and government really need to focus on a drawdown of carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. Um, so it's really about committing to advancing policies and making investments in technology and, and industries that are actually going to further that. Um, 
the reality is, and we say this even in our industry, there's no silver bullet, right? The climate crisis is going to be an all hands on deck, all of the above approach, private, public, reduction, removal. Um, and we also see this in, a, in our industry. We can't let like the lack of a perfect solution stop us from moving forward. There is no perfect solution. It's the same as, you know, the concrete industry. It's we see that these small incremental steps are leading us and building upon it in the right direction. And, and we just, you know, same, the same would apply as we need to move forward um, in, in using the technologies that are available to us and investing in both carbon reductions as well as carbon removal um, policy and industry. Thank you, Laurie. I'm gonna go quickly now to Greg, Gregor as well. Well, I I don't have huge expectations of the of the COP in Glasgow. Uh, the national governments, in particular, show up every time, and you know they say things, and and then they don't deliver them. So it, it really is all about uh, walking the talk, because uh, I mean we're no, nowhere close to goals and promises and commitments that have been made in the past. Um, you know, for it's all about government taking action, enabling entrepreneurs and businesses to do their best work. That's that's like creating stronger regulatory frameworks and saying this is the path we're on, this is where we're going, and here are investments to make it possible to happen. Um, that it just has to be more, much more direct, much more real time and um, and there have to be results on the ground and that's unfortunately city governments can do that more readily they're much more operational uh, they're they're challenged by the load that they carry just trying to keep everything running and functioning uh, and a lot of a lot of challenges but um, at least they can deliver on infrastructure they can deliver the change we need the national governments to start shifting the tax dollars that are going into subsidies to fossil fuel into decarbonizing, basically direct investment in clean tech uh, entrepreneurs and companies and drive the pace. Yeah, thank you. So we're hearing no silver bullets, walk the talk and results on the ground. I think we're going to Cameron next. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I think to make good on the promise on the climate, you know, the investments in, in climate finance, um, I think what excites me the most right now is that there's enthusiasm and excitement and, and even dreaded speculation in the, in the sector and it's driving investment. And it, I think it's very complementary to what we should do to also bring in people who see an opportunity. Um, and I think that's, uh, so more investment leads to more entrepreneurs and, and better outcomes. So that's what I'm hoping. Here, here, and soon. I'm going to go a little bit different and I'm going to coming from the, the the supply side where we supply into vehicles or into stationary storage. I'm going to say that I think the government could do a lot in the area of supply chain and helping different areas to secure global supply chains that make it easier for us to make choices that allow us to, to have that better outcome from a carbon perspective and just kind of help with policies or with in-country development that helps us to drive profitability through our supply chain. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Yeah, to wrap it up, do I? So uh, <laughs> I, will, I will look into the crystal ball and hope they say, everybody, please be quiet now. Mark Carney and Greta are gonna speak and tell you what to do. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I like that, I wanna see that be a fly on the wall for that discussion. Amazing. Um, okay, well, I'm going to wrap up. Um, I will be in COP, so I'll be posting updates uh, as I'm there. If you have any questions, you want to get in touch, please um, connect with me. And I hope to hear from you and uh, continue this important discussion. But for now, from me, that is all. Thank you to our panelists. Over to you, Sean. Hey, thanks so much, Javaria, and thanks to everyone here. I, you know, I'm looking through the Q and A, uh, and I'm I'm really happy that we covered off uh, many of the questions in the comments. So look forward to uh, some of the conversations that will happen in the breakout rooms afterwards. Because, you know, one of the things that um, you know really stood out for me um, in the questions was. How does somebody without a tech or science background get involved in clean tech? And I know, Lori, you're hosting one of the breakout sessions. Um, so please, please hit up Lori's expertise. Lori and I 
together created a sales and marketing uh, C-level peer group back in the day. And, uh, you know, this is, this is really the pathway in. Um, and so please uh, connect with Lori about that. Um, I think, you know, I really wouldn't mind um, if, if I were to ask one question here, it's also from Tony and this one's for Cam, just with the time that we have left it, um, and welcome any other comments after Cam from the panelists, panelists here, uh, perhaps Colin, you have some comments based on your experience as well, but what Cam, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the, what's changed now um, in the clean tech bust? Um, to what we're seeing in terms of how you described, you know, just an incredible amount of interest from the capital markets. You know, certainly we see the entrepreneurs here, you know, rising to meet the challenge. You know, people referenced uh, Elon Musk, you know, bringing some uh, uh, celebrity and, and some substantial uh, companies and products to market that have reached wide appeal. Um, but Cam, really, what's, what's changed? Why? 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 Why, why now? Oh, it's such a long question, John. <laughs> um, what's changed? I think um, what used to be seen as, as innovation and a nice to have is now a must have for a whole bunch of reasons. You could put that into clean tech or any parts of the tech ecosystem. I think there's way less fear and intimidation of perceived complexity when it right, when it mean, because there's now markets for, you know, the tech sector has been on a 20 year bull run you know, so post dot bomb, quote unquote, you know, there's been this phenomenal run. And I think it's just moving in, it's this sort of snow plowing into every other subsector as innovation drives huge upside. And I think there's less, less fear and more interest and, and yeah, I'll stop there, but I, that's what I'm thinking. Colin, Lori, uh, any comments? Yeah, I actually do because I came from traditional tech and I think we were talking about this early on. We need this like silo effect of clean tech being separate from high tech. And as somebody who's made that transition purposefully, um, it's actually been very beneficial to integrate and bring over the skill set from high tech. It was never just about developing software and, and letting it be, you know, you build it and they will come. It was about sales and marketing engine. It was never really about the technology. And I think this hybridization of moving traditional tech talent into clean tech is a real benefit for the industry and seeing it as um, transferable skills, regardless of whether you've been in clean tech, it's still selling technology to end users and the same skills that were really successful in, in software and all of the other industries that I've come from are equally transferable and in fact, super beneficial to very traditional tech, clean tech industries. So I think that's been really beneficial that change, that kind of collapse of silos. Colin from clean tech bus to clean tech boom, what's going on? Yeah, we certainly went through that in the hydrogen world. <laughs> and, uh, I think, um, it, it probably goes back to the sort of platform foundational. There was a lot of stuff that has to go into place and those all take much longer than everybody hopes. So just the change in the public attitude to get the policies in place and to believe that those policies are gonna stay with different uh, political climates is, is super important and takes a long time. Uh, in a hydrogen world, you know, safety codes and standards took a decade to get transform from the industrial world to the public world. Um, George Bush had to wear Nomex gloves when he first filled a hydrogen car 10, 15 years ago, right? Now my mother does it on a weekly basis kind of thing, right? So, so I think that's a, you know, that's a good thing to understand is a lot of things are in place now. And, um, and, and I think the time crunch has got shorter. So people are willing to get going on it. And it, it always, you know, 2050 seemed a long way away, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's closer than what, 1970 kind of thing, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Think, uh, hey, thanks for that, Laurie and uh, Colin and Cam. Um, uh, this uh, last question is tailor-made for Sue and Gregor, so maybe we'll end with Gregor. Sue, I'd love to hear, you know, like, what are you seeing? Like, how do we change the mentality of government from your perspective, based on your comments, um, you know, what, what do we need to do from industry side and what do you think needs to happen within government? Um, so we'll go Sue and then we'll close uh, 
with with uh, with comments from Gregor. Yeah, that, that's a tough that's a tough one. That's a tough one, Sean, definitely. And I think if we knew that answer it would probably help us all. But I'm going to say um, probably just continue to raise our voice and get involved. You know, the, the results aren't always what we want them to be, but going quiet isn't the answer. So continue to raise our voice. And the more times we do that, uh, the better. I think another thing that we've really learned at Extro is um, that voice can't be alone. So reaching out to partners and people in your network to form a collaboration or a consortium goes a lot farther with government. And the, the, the more broad you can make that consortium. So by that, I mean, pick partners within the clean tech space, but with different technologies than yours. So we can work with fuel cells, we can work with batteries, we can work with truck manufacturers and passenger cars and micromobility, get as many to represent the scalability of what you're doing, and then also make it geographically spread. So don't look for everybody within the BC borders or within the Alberta borders. Look for people that are here, look for people that are in the US to really demonstrate to government that this is a, a global issue that they could lead with if they find those solutions. So I think that would be kind of my recommendation is to network and raise your voice. Yeah, thanks so much, Sue. Um, just a little bit of personal history. I, um, I, I, I went traveling before I joined the city of Vancouver for six months. And, um, you know, when you come back from something like that, you really kind of have your pick of the litter and you can really kind of change the course of your life and, and your career. And uh, I very purposefully uh, found my way into working for uh, Gregor um, and Brian, who's up next, and working alongside Javaria. Um, and I, you know, I really purposefully chose to work in an environment that was led by an entrepreneur um, and uh, an entrepreneur who had, uh, you know, a vision for the future that aligned with mine. And I benefited from working in an environment that certainly didn't feel like government. So even though I'm here today working for the federal government in a very similar agency that works to attract investment to, to Canada, you know, I, I, I really feel like I felt that DNA of what it is to work in government and be able to get things done. So I think maybe we'll close, uh, <laughs> Gregor, just a little, you know, I, I'd like to know. You know, like how do you how do you get government to shift its mentality and how it actually goes about um, facilitating the green economy? Couldn't 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 serve up a better question for a better guy, I think. Well, yeah, it's a big question, and I think Sue had some excellent points uh, about raising our voices and networking, uh, and that's you know from the granular to just reach out, just reach out and work it with whoever you have and know in government, both on the political side and, and the bureaucracies, like you just gotta, you just gotta get active, as active as you can and, and build strength as a network, which is happening that there's so much momentum, uh, you know, across clean tech, uh, climate tech right now. Uh, and, and we're on the radar, but everyone's gotta work it and, and push harder. I think the, the other piece is, um, I mean, some of us do need to step up and run for office or step into government jobs and, and take over in ministries and departments and agencies. Like we need people who are, are already have led in business and know how to be an entrepreneur, know how to get things done. Just dive in there. There's there are lots of career opportunities and, and that then you create opportunities for others because uh, you're inside it and you can help make change. But it's a it's an enormous beast. The federal government, you know, the scale is is massive. Um, so, you know, it's going to take a lot of us continuing to push. And and um, the world is changing. We're we're all seeing it. Uh, a lot of us are worried about it, and that's motivating us. But with the most conservative organizations, from scientists to insurance companies to financial institutions, are are rewriting, recoding everything. So that's going to play out. Government is arguably the the most conservative and resistant to change that's it's designed to resist change and and maintain status quo um and and now we're at a point in in history where that doesn't work anymore government is going to have to move a lot faster and we've seen it with the covid pandemic we, we've seen unprecedented shift in the pace that government can deliver services on the ground and keep us alive and and adjust to a, an economy that's in flux. So I, I think 
we've proved to ourselves that that we can do a lot better. Um, we need government to focus, pivot off of this COVID pandemic onto building back better. We've, we've heard these words. We need to really push on that being delivered, that, that we see real investments in green recovery and in the clean tech sectors that we're working at. Like we need to see that direct result and, and for government to be nimble. And some of us have to dive right in there and do more about it from the inside too. Yeah, thanks so much, Gregor. That's, you know, what a way to end. Um, I, uh, I uh, just want to thank all of our panelists for participating. I uh, couldn't believe you all said yes, um, because, um, you know, it was uh, my fault that we had this amb ambitious five panel, five person panel conversation, which, you know, in most places is quite unruly, but I think we covered a lot of ground uh, in, a, in an ordered way and, and answered everyone's questions and left uh, everyone with a lot to think about, consider and start to integrate in how they build their businesses moving, moving forward. So uh, with that, we'll thank you all uh, for, for helping us uh, uh, walk away with some lessons from, from uh, you know, truly what is not the usual suspects. You know, we have a lot of clean tech conversations in Vancouver, and I think we found, um, you know, a way to have a conversation in a very productive way, but with some voices that we, you know, haven't heard from. So, you know, huge thanks to everyone again. Um, uh, I just want to acknowledge a fellow board member before we transition, Rolf DeClear with uh, Pender Ventures. Rolf, you're, uh, you're sticking around for the um, networking cloning, yeah? Yeah, yes, I am. Looking forward to it. Okay, so Rolf, uh, I just want to highlight him because um, uh, Rolf's been involved in some of the deals uh, that you all know and love and has been a bit, a bit of a mentor of mine in the uh, clean tech uh, venture realm. Um, so please find yourself in a room with Rolf because uh, uh, he's, uh, you know, we're very happy to have him on the board of the VEF and, and I'm happy to count him as a, as a mentor of mine. And I noted your comments in the chat Rolf, and you know, uh, I think those were all re well received by everyone here. Um, so uh, Brian Buggy is up to give us our first community announcement. We, well, our only community announcement today as part of our lightning pitches, which will come up immediately following Brian. Um, Brian, did you have a slide? Hi everyone, I do have a slide. Okay, I'll let you so put that up. Take it okay, away, it'll Brian, work. and um, uh, and then we'll move on to our lightning pitches. So this is uh, over to you, Brian, for a uh, timely community announcement. And can you see it? Yes. Excellent. So hi, everybody. Great to see so many familiar faces. I'm here today to announce our upcoming Angels for Climate Solutions program. It's a 16-week education and training program to increase the availability of angel stage capital to accelerate climate tech. So as, as you already know, we've entered uh, a decade of climate action where you know, collectively we just have to do everything we can to deliver on our you know, COP21 Paris commitments and our city's climate emergency action plan. And you know, quite frankly, find ways to cut our emissions by half uh, you know, by 2030 over 2007 levels. So, in this world, we need to you know, rapidly accelerate innovation to reduce our carbon footprint and greenhouse gas emissions, and also increase our access to smart and effective early stage capital for our startup community right here in Vancouver. So this program, Angels for Climate Solutions, addresses those needs within our ecosystem by empowering angel investors to fund climate-backed solutions and inspire the innovation to meet our climate goals. So the next slide, we, um, <clears throat> you know, the program is really in two parts intersecting with um, the angel investors. So one stream for angel investors and a second one for our startup community. And we'll be uh, taking 10 angel investors in and 20 startups with a minimum of 35% minority representation in, in each group. So a very diverse group. And at the end of the program, we'll have a $100,000 investment made available to one of those winning startups. 
And so this is for climate tech solutions, targeting the reduction of GHG emissions or addressing the impacts of climate change. So applications are open and we have a deadline, application deadline next week uh, for the startup cohort. So please check it all out at vancovereconomic.com forward slash climate angels. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Sean. Thanks so much, Brian. And uh, we saw the announcement and we felt like it was very important and timely for this group to hear. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing. Uh, I was a bit loose with the 100 seconds for your pitch, Brian, um, but that was on purpose because uh, we're going to get serious with the 100 seconds for our uh, companies who are joining us right now. Um, these companies were nominated by E at UBC and Foresight. Um, so we're really pleased that all four companies are here. However, we're going to be pretty tough on the 100 second pitch rule to give us enough time for some networking following. So uh, first up, we have Taba from Blue Dot Motorworks. Oh, Isabella. <laughs> Hi, Isabella. Nice to meet you. And I think sorry, apologies. I had a I had a mouse issue, <laughs> couldn't get my screen working. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I just share my screen. Just give me one second. I think uh, you can see my screen. Perfect. Hi everyone, I'm Isabella Tabo, CEO at Blue Dot Motor Works. Our vision is accelerating electrification of their driving. So uh, climate crisis, uh, we've been hearing about it over the news and it's sort of like a catastrophic uh, consequences of the global warming and greenhouse emission. It has been uh, estimated the largest end contributor of the, uh, contributor of the greenhouse uh, gas, the road transportation. And it's estimated by uh, 2030, 1.2 billion conventional vehicles on the road. So their path to hit this target that's set by UN and countries to reduce greenhouse emotion, uh, emission is a little bit a slow path, and at least we need to be faster, five times faster as this existing strategy. If we sort of they come up with a different solution and replace all the EVs with the, all the conventional vehicles with EVs, about estimated about $15 trillion of the embodied wealth with these vehicles, we're going to throw it out. So what is the missing link is the technology that can sort of scale to, the, to face this magnitude of the challenge. And at Blue Dot Motor Works, we are the bridge that gap, uh, bridge the, uh, that uh, sort of the uh, bridge the gap between the EV and the conventional vehicle. Our solution is retrofit hybrid systems that is the plug-in hybrid or plug-in hybrid that convert any conventional vehicles into the plug-in hybrid. Our solution is applicable to any time of the vehicles. We have two prototype that's working prototype is the normal and humpback that uh, easily that can be uh, scalable, uh, low cost of the transformation, and can be easily done by any third party. So what is the market that we are facing here? The total available market that we are looking into is $7.8 trillion. And what is serviceable available market for BDM is $2.4 trillion. We are looking at the vehicles about three years older to up to 20 years, 15 to 20 years, and the driving range between the 10 to 15 mile period per day. So uh, the market is bullish. Everybody looking into the EV solution, auto industry is quite heavily invested in EV solution, 16, uh, at least $16 billion being invested from VCs in climate tech. And uh, we can see US and Canada government, they put quite a bit of emphasis and budget in the um, uh, sort of clean tech and clean solution for reducing greenhouse and gas emission. Our technology is proven technology. We have three working prototypes that have been out there for the past three years. We have two patented that have been sus uh, submitted and we are working on more patents to sort of solidify our uh, product. Uh, the pro the, our technology and solution is highly scalable. It low cost of capital to produce this unit 
as well as we are predicting within the five years, we will be able to produce 50,000 units per, um, sort of uh, per year. Also, the, in terms of the installation, we are uh, in a partnership with the third parties that can be easily installed. And in these units, they can be easily transferred between the vehicles and uh, sort of like a, you can take it off. It wouldn't change the vehicle's agnostic and uh, um, uh, function. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. I, I may never be invited to do the lightning pitch ever again because I I have a really difficult time ending anyone after 100 seconds. Thank you, really appreciate you joining. Uh, up next, we have Philip Morkel from Hydrogas Energy. Philip? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Philip Morkel, Hydrogas Energy founder. I have 100 seconds. So here are three things that can happen in Africa's Lake Kivu in 100 seconds. Each follows depending on whether we do or don't degas its methane and CO2. I just share the screen to show. It emits 23 megatons of carbon, 58,000 people asphyxiate under a toxic gas cloud. 20 million people spend $200,000 on cheaper carbon negative energy, all in 100 seconds. If we don't go ahead and one and two happen, every 100 seconds when the lake erupts, but when we build our degas projects, only number three happens. Do the math. For a major day-long lake eruption, that's an existential problem. Two to six gigatons of carbon, up to five million dead. We can stop that. We've done our R&D pilot testing feasibility for a 600 megawatt biogas to power facility. DRC in Rwanda will be supplied for 50 plus years. Pipe gas to two million homes replaces charcoal for cooking. Low cost energy sales, 50 billion in that time. Offsets could double the earnings. The, um, sorry, I wanted to shut that off. Um, we're funding to start up the first of 12 projects in 2023. Our mission is first save and enrich lives, prevent emissions, reinstate the forests. Thank you. Philip, thanks so much. Up next, we have Kevin Kung from Safi Organics. Can you see my slide? Yes. Great. Uh, sorry about that. So most crop and forest residues, which I call biomass, is often very loose, wet and bulky, which makes them very expensive to transport and handle. And as a result, most rural communities are shut out from the bioeconomy because it's not economical for them to make use of these waste. They end up either burning it in the open, which creates pollution, or in the cases of uh, the West Coast, a lot of the excess builds up actually causes a catastrophic wildfires. We are developing small-scale, low-cost portable systems that can latch onto the back of tractors and pickup trucks and deploy to rural, hard-to-access regions to locally upgrade and densify the residues on site into higher-value bioproducts, ranging from fertilizers to biofuel to chemicals that requires no external energy and fuel to run, thereby building these uh, self-sustaining, closed-loop uh, rural economies. Right now, we run a pilot engaging with 5,300 farmers and have added more than $800,000 in real livelihood and also are removing about 10,000 uh, tons of CO2 per year. We are honored this week to have been awarded the Earthshot Prize uh, from Prince William, and that one million pound is actually coming to Vancouver because right now we are actively looking for to set up an R&D site here looking for affordable land, biomass supplier, as well as the end user to test the products. So if you know of any one of them like that, let us know, uh, trash.is.cash at ubc.ca. Thanks so much. So Sean, you're muted.
Oops. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, really appreciate you sharing that story. Really exciting. Our final pitch goes to Arthur Chen. All right. Nice to meet everyone. I'm Arthur from Verdi, and we are modernizing irrigation systems to help farmers customize water and nutrient delivery for every plant. Agriculture is a $10 trillion industry that we all depend on. But without one single resource, water, it would all come to a grinding halt. And water is running out. In the US alone, almost 200 million acres of farmland are under drought as we speak. Even up here in Canada, farmers are starting to feel the same effects. That's why at Verdi, we help farmers become resilient to drought by building swarms of smart irrigation devices that allow them to control exactly where water goes in the field. For the first time, farmers have the precision to save two times more water than traditional solutions and personalize plant health care. And that does more than just conserve water. In our first success story, we helped Canada's largest wine company sell wine for three times higher price. We can increase yield and reduce carbon emissions. We sold out for 2021 with 500 devices deployed to seven customers. We have 25K in ARR and a wait list of over 200 acres. Our customers include the world's largest wine company and top Canadian brands like Mission Hill. We sell our solution as an annual subscription of $50 per device, targeted first to the wine industry before expanding down market into fruits and vegetables. We're advised by agribusiness experts from DuPont, Trimble, and other companies, and are backed by investors, including Alchemist Accelerator. So if you'd like to learn more about the future of agriculture that we're building, we'd love to meet you. Thank you. Arthur, mic drop. How is that? Congratulations, that was awesome. Um, so are you with E at UBC or, or Foresight? Yeah, we're with E at UBC. Awesome job. They're, uh, they're, they're running you through the paces. That was great. What a way to Thank end. Um, hey, thanks so much uh, to all of our lightning pitchers. Thank you, Brian, for that uh, community announcement. Um, and before we go and move into the networking, I just wanted to share with you all um, our next event. Uh, let me log on here. Um, uh, Angie and our other board members are going to slap me on the hand. I, I think, I hope this is our last virtual event, but it's going to be a doozy. Um, uh, this is uh, navigating an era of unprecedented liquidity. So uh, if you are interested in this conversation, as you should be, um, this will be one not to miss. November 30th, 2021, from 345 to 530. Um, I, I noticed that we had an incredible um, number of companies that were still, uh, that were still, um, sorry, that were still, we had an incredible number of attendees that still stayed on the line, despite it being one of the most beautiful days this week and a couple of days of rain ahead. So we must have been doing something right. Um, I, I again want to thank uh, everybody that participated today. Um, they say that you know a panel or a virtual event is the lowest calorie um, way to participate in an event, but I figured uh, from the fact that most people stayed on, we had a very high calorie event today. Um, so let's work off those calories in the virtual uh, networking room, which will be open from five from now until five thirty. Um, we've got some great folks that uh, have signed on to talk with you. Um, therefore, you don't want to be hearing from me anymore. So I'm going to stop sharing. We'll move you to the uh, breakout rooms, and we genuinely thank you for participating, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks so much. <laughs>